Hi, and welcome to our video on bioenergetic strategies. This is the first of two videos on bioenergetic strategies. This is going to look at how living things have adapted in the macro sense. What do organisms do to deal with living in a universe that has energetic constraints? Questions like why does this hummingbird need to continually feed in order to remain alive and functioning in its environment? The question we're going to be answering here is how do living systems use energy in the big picture? In this video, we're going to look at ectotherms and endotherms, the two major groups of animals in terms of how they respond to the energetics of their environment. We're going to look at implications of size on the energetics of organisms. And we're finally going to look at some energy strategies that different organisms use. Generally speaking, when we look at how organisms handle constraints of their environment, there are two major strategies. You could be a regulator or a conformer. A regulator spends energy in order to maintain internal conditions within a certain range, whereas a conformer does not spend any energy to do that and adapts to be able to deal with a wide range of conditions in the environment as a result. When considering how organisms handle the energetics of their environment, we're basically only going to consider animals. And there are two strategies that animals can use. Thermoregulators are what we would call endotherms. These are organisms that spend energy in order to maintain their internal body temperature. A good example of this would be an ostrich, though all mammals and all birds are examples of thermoregulators. Thermoconformers are what we would call ectotherms, and these are organisms that do not spend much energy to maintain their internal temperature, and so as a result, basically are the temperature of their ambient environment. A good example of this is the snake, which you can actually see in this picture as the dark object being held by the human. Notice that the endothermic human's internal temperature is considerably higher than that of the snake. That's a great example of the difference between ectotherms and endotherms. It's important to understand that one strategy is not better than the other. They both function and they both produce life forms that are well adapted for the environments in which they live. But as this graph shows, endotherms like the lizard shown here can tolerate a much wider range of environmental temperatures than endotherms can. If you subject that mouse to conditions where its internal temperature moves outside of that narrow range of acceptable internal temperatures, that mouse is going to die. And of course, we know this as humans because we know how dangerous conditions like hypothermia, getting too cold, or hyperthermia, like a very high fever, can be for our internal physiology. Endotherms and ectotherms represent two different strategies that have benefits and consequences. Endotherms need to maintain a stable internal temperature. Ectotherms don't. The internal temperature of an ectotherm is almost entirely dependent upon the temperature of its environment. Since endotherms are maintaining their internal temperature within that acceptable range, they can engage in activities that require greater energy for longer periods of time in their environment than ectotherms can. But of course, endotherms need to spend a good deal of those activities going out and getting the kinds of inputs or food that they need in order to continue regulating their internal temperature. While ectotherms don't have to do this, they do not need to spend much of the energy that they get from the food that they eat in maintaining their temperature. The trade-off, of course, being that they can only engage in highly energetic activities like their feeding strategies when their external environment is at the temperatures that allow them to engage in those highly energetic practices. Another way of looking at this is that endotherms use considerably more energy than ectotherms do, but they can use this in order to be more active over longer periods of time than ectotherms are. Ectotherms do much less, but endotherms can't tolerate the sorts of big temperature swings in the environment that ectotherms do without engaging in various strategies needed to regulate their internal temperature and keep it within the acceptable range. Another way of considering the relationship between animals and their metabolism is to look at their size. This graph plots the amount of energy that they are converting per day as a function of their body weight. I pulled some values out of this graph and I've highlighted them here. An organism with a mass of 0.1 kilograms, something akin to a rodent, will typically have an energy expenditure of 10 kilocalories per day. This ratio is approximately 0.01. Interestingly, an organism with a mass of 1,000 kilograms, something more akin to a large mammal like a hippo or a rhinoceros, will have a general energy expenditure of 10,000 kilocalories per day. 
It's not surprising that larger animals expend more energy, but what is surprising is the change in the ratio that we see. Notice that the ratio for the larger animal is actually 10 times lower than the ratio for the smaller animal. Per unit of mass, smaller animals will spend comparatively more energy than larger animals do in order to maintain their life functions. Another way of saying this is that the less mass an animal has, the higher its metabolic rate is. An obvious question for this is why, as it almost seems counterintuitive. Consider all of the different ways that an animal can exchange heat with its environment. If we go back to the graph and remove some of the lines from before, we can see that as we consider the relationship between surface area of the organism and the weight of the organism, we can see that as we follow these values up through the graph, towards the middle of the graph, the increase in surface area is outpaced by the increase in weight. This is another example of a surface area to volume ratio consideration. Just like the surface area of cells affects the efficiency with which those cells exchange materials with their environment, the surface area of animals affects the rate with which animals exchange heat with theirs. Smaller animals are going to exchange heat at a much faster rate, the consequence being that smaller endotherms, like our hummingbird from the beginning, have to eat constantly in order to produce the energy necessary to maintain their internal environment to counteract the effect of constant heat exchange between the organism and its environment. Animals are going to adapt to their energetic constraints and the constraints of their environment in different ways. There are a variety of strategies that animals use in order to deal with the energetics of the environment in which they live. A classic example of this is hibernation or torpor in which animals reduce the energy that they're using in unfavorable environments. Mammals that hibernate generally hibernate during the winter months when there is not a lot of food available for them and the temperatures of the external environment are so cold that they would have tremendous difficulty acquiring the amount of energy that they need in order to remain within their tolerable range of internal temperatures. By reducing their energy use during these times of year, the mammal can survive those unfavorable conditions and can resume its normal energetic life cycle once more favorable conditions return. Certain animals like this frog can even tolerate being temporarily frozen frozen in their environment by being able to, to enter extreme states of torpor. Another classic example of strategies used by animals in order to maintain their internal body temperature is shivering. Shivering is an involuntary muscular response. Muscles engage in this process through aerobic cellular respiration, which produces a lot of metabolic heat energy that can then be used by the body to help maintain a tolerable internal body temperature. There are also a variety of different lifestyle strategies that animals will use in order to deal with or even exploit the energetics of their environment. Marine iguanas in the Galapagos Islands, for instance, spend large portions of their day sunning themselves on rocks. This enables them to engage in short bursts of highly energetic feeding behavior when they dive and feed on the algae that's growing on rocks in the ocean. After a period of feeding, they'll then re-emerge onto the rocks where they will continue to absorb heat from the sun until their internal body temperature is raised back to the point where they can feed again. They will also spend large amounts of time on the rocks in large groups of individuals, which helps them maintain their internal temperature at a higher level than they would if they remained in solitary configurations. This is just one example, and it might be a fun game for you to pick a different organism and figure out how its lifestyle strategies enable it to deal with the energetic requirements of its environment. Thanks so much for watching our video on macro bioenergetic strategies. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how energy considerations influence the biology and behavior of endotherms and ectotherms. Make sure that you can describe how the metabolic needs of an organism are affected by its size. And finally, make sure that you can explain how various behaviors and organisms help those organisms to cope with their energy needs. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.